Thank you very much. Um, I, critical thinking is a very important part of our society. I'm constantly telling that to my children <laughs> and making some progress, I think. Um, a, a month ago, I issued a challenge to President Barack Obama and Governor Mitt Romney give at least one campaign speech on a substantive policy issue lasting at least 15 minutes that you know, I, you know I, made, I made this big enough, I thought, without my glasses, but I can't. Anyway, that does not contain a single factual error or misstatement. That meant no sugarcoating of your record, no exaggerated claims about your opponent's record, and no assertions that are technically true but lacking crucial context. My challenge was met with a deafening silence. No one from either campaign even acknowledged what I had written. They didn't even have the courtesy to send me a nasty email. <laughs> I actually wasn't surprised. The stakes are too high in presidential politics for such niceties as the truth. I believe both President Obama and Governor Romney are serious men who, while having very different visions for the country, care deeply about this nation. Yet they're both politicians. And in politics, you only succeed if you win. After 30 years of covering government, politics, and diplomacy, I have found there's little difference between two, the two parties on one critical issue they will both stretch the truth if they believe it will give them a political advantage. That does not mean that as voters or consumers of news we need to accept that reality. That is the rationale behind my column, The Fact Checker. At least five days a week I take a detailed look at a politician's statement and examine the facts behind that claim. And then I make a ruling ranging from one to four Pinocchios on how truthful that statement is. It's kind of like a reverse restaurant review. So, one Pinocchio is selective telling of the truth, some omissions and exaggerations, but no real outright falsehood. For instance, uh, President Obama last week said that women earn 77% as men. Now, that's a statistic from Commerce Department data, and it said that's a legitimate source. But it's just one of many ways to measure this problem, and it happens to be the worst. If you adjust for various factors, the gap is not 23 cents, but could be as little as 5 cents. Now, two Pinocchios means significant omissions and exaggerations. There's some factual error may be involved, but not necessarily, because after all, a politician can create a false, misleading impression by playing with words and using legalistic language that means little to ordinary people. As an example, Romney recently talked about regulators multiplying under Obama and then cited a figure, a very specific figure, that the number of federal employees had grown by almost 150,000 under the th this president. Now that's a true figure, but when you dig into the data, at least 83,000 of those people were in the Defense Department, Veterans Hospitals, or Homeland Security, all areas that Romney says he wants to strengthen. And employment in most of the traditional regulatory agencies has actually gone down under Obama. So Romney was using real data in a suspect way. That's why he got two Pinocchios. Three Pinocchios is significant factual error or obvious contradictions. And this is when things get increasingly untethered from reality. For instance, the Obama campaign recently launched an infographic called The Life of Julia, in which they compare what would happen to one woman through her whole life from being a baby all the way up to retirement under Obama's policies and Romney's policies. And I, I thought it was a really interesting way to try to connect the laws that are passed in Congress to people's everyday lives. Because a lot of times people don't, can't understand that connection. But there was a social security graphic in this series that was very misleading because it suggested that under Romney, Julia's social security benefits would be cut 40%, whereas under Obama, nothing would be changed. Everything would be hunky-dory. But the Romney figure in that graphic was based on an extreme interpretation of what would happen to high earners under policies designed to put Social Security on a more sustainable footing, policies that Romney had indicated he was interested in. And it ignored the fact that if you do nothing, benefits would be cut 23% for everyone. And moreover, Obama himself had offered to cut Social Security benefits 
as part of a failed budget deal last year with the Republicans. So that's why they've got three Pinocchios. Now, four Pinocchios is just for an absolute whopper. <laughs> now, that's Mitt Romney claiming that Americans are the only people on earth who place their hands over their hearts during the playing of the national anthem. <laughs> a notion that was quickly disproven by looking at YouTube clips. You know, I saw the, there were the Russians, there were the <laughs> Japanese, they were all like that. Uh, and then there's President Obama claiming that President Rutherford B. Hayes thought the telephone was an invention without much use. In fact, Obama dissed Hayes and said that's why he wasn't on Mount Rushmore, because he was looking backwards, he wasn't looking forwards. <laughs> well, you know, I did a little searching, went into the records of the Hayes Presidential Library. They actually had a newspaper clipping of Hayes encountering the telephone the first time. He was amazed. In fact, it turns out Hayes was a complete techno geek. He got the very first telephone in Washington, and his phone number was one. <laughs> now, on rare occasions, I give a Geppetto checkmark for a completely truthful statement. It doesn't happen often, but, you know, hope springs eternal. Now, I, I will readily admit that these Pinocchios are a bit of a marketing gimmick. I mean, it's not especially scientific, and it is open to subjective analysis. The line between two Pinocchios and three Pinocchios is sometimes fuzzy, and I sometimes wish I could have a two and a half or something like that. But I do find it to be a useful tool for trying to maintain consistency over the months and weeks of writing these columns. Uh, I will sometimes go back and say, well, this sounds like that thing I did three months ago. Oh, I gave it a two. All right. Another two. <laughs> Uh, and during the Republican primaries, the people you would most expect to get higher Pinocchio ratings, like Michelle Bachman, they did indeed. <laughs> she got many, many fours. <laughs> Particularly, I gave her four once for when she claimed she had never made a misstatement during any of the debates. <laughs> <laughs> and she was proud of that fact. Now, my key goal, the key goal for my column is to help consumers of news become better judges of fact-based statements. I want readers to become more discerning about hearing the weasel words and caveats that politicians routinely insert in their comments in order to present a more rosy or dire picture than the facts would suggest. One of my favorite examples from this campaign is when President Obama declared, Chrysler has repaid every dime and more of what it owes American taxpayers for their support during my presidency. Now, every dime and more sounds like a bargain. It makes the president sound like a used car salesman. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what a great country. They pay back more than they owed. <laughs> and, you know, with interest. But then you notice the president stuck in these words. I call them Weasel words. During my presidency. So what does that mean? Well, it turns out Obama is only counting the $8.5 billion loan that he made to Chrysler, not the $4 billion loan that President Bush oh extended in his last month in office, which then, you know, President-elect Obama fully supported. In reality, U.S. taxpayers will not recoup about $1.3 billion of the entire $12.5 billion investment in Chrysler when all is said and done. So under the president's math, Chrysler paid back 100% of his loan and just 70% of Bush's loan. A more honest presentation would say U.S. taxpayers got back 90% of what they invested which is actually a, a good story if you think that, you know, it was important to save Chrysler and we saved those jobs and we have another, another competitive automaker. But in the effort to kind of spin the, the success story, they go too far. And he thought he got away with saying that by inserting the words in my presidency in his statement. But I gave him three Pinocchios. <laughs> now, many of the worst claims are in television... <laughs> advertisements. So I'll show some recent ads by both sides in this election and comment briefly on some of the misrepresented facts. Now first we'll begin with two ads released just this past week about Mitt Romney's record. The first one is from the Obama campaign. The second one is from the Romney campaign. Now let's see if I can do this. I'm Barack Obama and I approve this message. It started like this. I speak the language of business. I know how jobs are created. But it ended like this, one of the worst economic records in the country. When Mitt Romney was governor, Massachusetts lost 40,000 manufacturing jobs, a rate twice the national average, and fell 
to 47th in job creation, fourth from the bottom. Instead of hiring workers from his own state, Romney outsourced call center jobs to India. He cut taxes for millionaires like himself while raising them on the middle class and left the state 2.6 billion deeper in debt. So now, when Mitt Romney talks about what he'd do as president, I know what it takes to create jobs. Remember, we've heard it all before. I know how jobs are created. Romney Economics. It didn't work then, and it won't work now. Here's, now this is the Romney version. Mitt Romney on day one. The difference is strong leadership. As governor of Massachusetts, Mitt Romney had the best jobs record in a decade. Romney reduced unemployment to just 4.7%. He balanced every budget without raising taxes. He did it by bringing parties together to cut through gridlock. From day one as president, Mitt Romney's strong leadership will make all the difference on jobs. I'm Mitt Romney, and I approve this message. I, I sincerely hope that TV ads require those ads to be run right after each other. <laughs> One after the other. Amazingly, both of these ads rely on the same data to make their claims. It just depends on how you manipulate the statistics at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The Obama ad says that Massachusetts fell, fell, to 47th, street, 47th in the nation. Now, that's a blended record over four years. And like Obama today, Romney started his governorship in tough economic times. So a blended record brings down his overall record. The Romney ad says he has the best record in decade. In a decade, that's not comparing him to other states, but to previous Massachusetts governors, which was a pretty low bar. <laughs> the Obama ad says Romney raised taxes and fees. The Romney ad says he raised no taxes. The key word there is fees. He didn't really raise taxes, but he boosted fees dramatically, which some people would say is a stealth tax increase. The Romney ad says he balanced four budgets. The Obama ad says he increased the debt by $2.6 billion. Now, Massachusetts, like most states, requires a balanced budget, so the governor has no choice. It has to be balanced. And the state debt, however, is different, largely different than national debt. It's mostly for capital investments. Though Romney did continue a trend started by his predecessors of paying some operating expenses out of debt. Anyway, now we'll look at two ads that use manipulated facts to give a false impression. The first is a Democratic ad trying to show Romney is a flip-flopper on the issue of an individual mandate. I oppose the idea of a federal mandate. Our bill was a state solution to a state problem within the rights of the Constitution. The last thing I'd ever do would be to take what we had done for one state and impose it on the entire nation. What we did, I think, is the ultimate conservative plan. We said people have to take responsibility for getting insurance, if they can afford it, or paying their own way. No more free riders. You backed away from mandates on a national basis. Oh, no, I like mandates. If somebody can afford insurance and decides not to buy it, <clears throat> and then they get sick, they ought to pay their own way, as opposed to expect the government to pay their way. That's an American principle. We have a health care plan. You, you look at, at, at Wyden Bennett, that's a health care plan that a number of Republicans think is a very good health care plan, one that we support. Take a look at that one. Wyden Bennett would cover everybody. We have an individual mandate, and we think that's the way to go. The right way to proceed is to reform health care. That we can do as we did it in Massachusetts, as Wyden Bennett is proposing doing it at the national level. Now, that makes him look like a horrible flip-flopper. Uh, now, I looked very closely at the full interviews in which these snippets were taken, and Romney always made it clear that he thought an individual mandate, which ultimately formed the core of President uh, Obama's national health plan, should be, he made it clear he felt it should be left to the states. His concept was that each state should come up with its own way to achieve universal health care. But the Democratic National Committee, which made that ad, carefully clipped off the parts of the interview where he reiterated that principle. Now, ironically, Obama opposed an individual mandate when he ran in the Democratic primaries against Hillary Clinton. That was her concept, so of course Obama had to be against it. And I've often wondered what would have happened if Romney had been, gotten the Republican nomination and he had defeated Hillary Clinton in 2008. 
Would Romney, working with the Democratic Congress, have agreed to a national mandate? And would Obama now be running for president, saying he had always warned that individual mandate would not be acceptable to Americans? <laughs> now, let's look at a four Pinocchio ad by opponents to Obama. Washington promised to create American jobs if we passed their stimulus. But that's not what happened. Fact. Billions of taxpayer dollars spent on green energy went to jobs in foreign countries. The Obama administration admitted the truth that $2.3 billion of tax credits went overseas, while millions of Americans can't find a job. $1.2 billion to a solar company that's building a plant in Mexico. Half a billion to an electric car company that created hundreds of jobs in Finland and tens of millions of dollars to build traffic lights in China. President Obama wasted $34 billion on risky investments. The result? Failure. American taxpayers are paying to send their own jobs to foreign countries. Tell President Obama, American tax dollars should help American taxpayers. Well, this ad uses words like fact and truth, but virtually everything in that ad was wrong, incorrect, misleading. Yes, $2.3 billion of stimulus dollars out of $800 billion went to companies with foreign ownership or offices overseas, but the money was for jobs in the United States. It mentions a, a company building a plant in Mexico. Yes, they used the stimulus dollars to build a plant in California, but they were also separately building a plant in Mexico. And so forth. The same thing with the traffic lights and the, you know, the, the, the cars in Finland. I mean, it's, it's uh, and the unfortunate thing is that that, I believe that was a $23 million ad buy. It's, this is from a, one, of, one of these super PACs. So, you know, you have, you know, critical thinking, skeptics. <laughs> you shouldn't believe anything you see in any of these ads. Now, the most misleading ads are often about health care because it's such an emotional and confusing subject. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, we're going to look at four. The first one, it's, this is a, a clip. It's from a small section of a 17-minute uh, pro-Obama film, which was narrated by the actor Tom Hanks. And it involves the death of the president's mother and suggests that this is why he was motivated to work for, for a health care law against the odds. So we kind of come in the middle of the overall movie for this part. But he faced a fierce opposition, hostile to compromise. It'll be a cold day in hell before he socializes my country. After months of negotiation, it was unclear whether he could get the necessary votes. Some advised him to settle. He could still claim victory if he accepted less. I regularly told him, look, you don't have to spill this much political blood. You won't get the health care accomplishment you're seeking, but you will have something. But he knew from experience the cost of waiting. When my mom got cancer, she wasn't a wealthy woman, and it pretty much drained all her resources. She developed ovarian cancer, never really had good, consistent insurance. That's a tough thing to deal with, watching your mother die of something that could have been prevented. I don't think he wants to see anyone go through that. And he remembered the millions of families like his who feel the pressure of rising costs and the fear of being denied or dropped from coverage. Now, this is touching, but it's misleading. It's an interesting example of how snippets of interviews can be arranged to leave a particular impression without actually being individually untrue. The sequence we just saw evokes a famous story that candidate Obama told during the 2008 campaign that his mother, Stanley Ann Dunham, fought with her insurer over whether her cancer was a pre-existing condition that disqualified her from coverage. This is how he put it during the 2008 campaign. 
For my mother to die of cancer at age 53 and have to spend the last months of her life in the hospital room arguing with insurance companies because they're saying this may be a pre-existing condition and they don't have to pay her treatment, there's something fundamentally wrong about that. But the story wasn't correct. And Dunham's biographer revealed that, um, that there were serious problems with the way the president would describe that. And the fact that the claim is not directly repeated in this movie suggests the filmmakers knew there was a problem with the campaign story, but they wanted to keep some version of it in the film. So what actually happened is Obama's mother had a dispute over disability coverage. Disability insurance helps replace wages lost to illness, but her health insurance actually paid for her expenses from ovarian cancer. So you note the film doesn't actually repeat the claim that she was denied health insurance because of a pre-existing condition, fighting for treatment at her hotel room or in her hospital room. But what it do, this is what it does say. First, Hanks says the president knew the cost of waiting a reform, the disability coverage was not an issue in the health care debate. Second, the president says cancer, quote, drained all of her resources, but actually health insurance paid for her bills. So this was not the case of someone being bankrupted by tens of thousands of dollars in bills. In fact, her salary at the time working for a non-governmental organization in 1995 was $82,500, which is equivalent of $123,000 today. Michelle Obama says Dunham never really had, quote, good consistent insurance. It's unclear what she means by this, except that maybe Dunham had different jobs, some of which did not provide insurance, but she actually had a very good health plan when her cancer was discovered. Then four, the first lady suggests the death, quote, could have been prevented. Again, it wasn't an insurance issue. Before going overseas for her position in Indonesia, Dunham was too busy with work and had skipped an important test recommended by her doctor that would have spotted the cancer earlier. Then an Indonesian doctor diagnosed her problem as appendicitis and removed her appendix. So by the time her cancer was discovered, it was third stage. And finally, Hank says that Obama's family felt the pressure of rising costs and the fear of being denied or dropped from coverage. Again, that was not the case in this particular example. But each individual statement by itself was correct, but it gives this impression that is completely false. Now let's look at an ad by the, Re by the Republican Congressional Committee, Campaign Committee, that purports to look at problems that have emerged two years later with the health care law. Two years later, promises made, promises kept. This plan will reduce the cost of health care for millions. Instead, they've gone up by 2,200. Premiums, I think, have gone up 9%. We'll cut the problems we have with money around here by as much as three quarters of a trillion dollars. It's going to come with a price tag pretty hefty of $1.76 trillion. That's twice as much as originally thought. If you get like your doctor, you can keep them, or like your health insurance policy, you can keep them. It's just untrue. A lot of employers are going to drop their health insurance coverage to dump people on the government run exchanges. Health care that is available and affordable for all people. 23 million Americans will still be uninsured and still leaves 23 million people uninsured. Strengthen Medicare's long-term financial health. He's cutting Medicare by $500 billion. He cut seniors' home health care by 11%. It's a plan that asks everyone to take responsibility for meeting this challenge. Everybody. Exempting some from complying with the new health care law. They've been granted a special waiver from key provisions of the new law. All this coming out in just the first two years. Two years and 2,700 pages later, and there's still so much we don't know. It's time to repeal Obamacare once and for all. You don't trust me? All right, well... There are lots of suspect claims there, but, and, uh, but I will look at one specifically because it's a good example of how you can play games with numbers. That's the claim that the cost of the health care bill has doubled and that is now twice as much as originally thought. So here's what's going on. The original Congressional Budget Office estimate was that the health care law would cost $940 billion between 2010 and 2019. Now that's a bit of a lowball number because the first four years was implementation of the new law. But this new figure of 1.7 trillion that the ad proclaimed is for a completely different budget window, when more of the law would be implemented 
and it's for 11 years, not 10 years, even though the ad claimed it was 10 years. When the two, then the exact same years are put side by side, such as say 2016 or 2018, there are only slight differences in the estimates, mainly for technical reasons. So for instance, 2016, the original estimate showed gross costs for the healthcare bill of 161 billion, now it's 175 billion, which is in federal government terms is a virtual rounding error. <laughs> and then the net cost estimates, which include fees collected and that sort of thing, actually show a decline in the estimates. Now finally, let's look at a pair of ads by Republican and Democratic leaning groups in which they attack their opponents for trying to rein in runaway costs in Medicare. We'll first look at a um, Republican version and we'll go straight to the uh, Democratic version. Oops, come on. There we go. So this is the Republican version, if you can't tell. Hi, friend. I'm Pat Boone. Last year, a lot of promises were made regarding health care reform. But America's seniors knew forcing a bill through Congress when Americans overwhelmingly opposed it would be disastrous. And we were right. President Obama's health care law cuts $500 billion from Medicare and creates a board of 15 unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. It's like a Medicare IRS with the power to cut Medicare in order to pay for new government programs. This IPAB board can ration care and deny certain Medicare treatments so Washington can fund more wasteful spending. Your choices could be limited and you may not be able to keep your own doctor. Medicare will be bankrupt in nine years. But Washington politicians like John Tester are ignoring the problem, putting their own re-elections first. Call Senator Tester. Urge him to support real Medicare reform and protect our seniors. Tell him unaccountable bureaucrats should never have the power to deny you the care you deserve. And it is a Democratic ad. That's one of the more subtle ads I ever heard. <laughs> so, so, and you notice that the guy pushing the wheelchair looked a lot like Representative Paul Ryan. So what was going on here? The first ad was by a group known as the 60 Plus Association. And they attacked something known as the Independent Payment Advisory Board, or IPAD, which is made up of sub experts subject to Senate confirmation. And it's designed to reduce the rate of growth in Medicare spending if it exceeds a certain target rate. The board would make recommendations to reduce costs. And then beginning in 2018, if the targets were not met, the board will submit a plan to the White House and the Congress to achieve the necessary cuts. And Congress could repass different sets of cuts or reject the iPad recommendations by three-fifths vote in the Senate. In effect, it was designed to mimic the Military Base Closing Commission done after the end of the Cold War by making politically difficult decisions that lawmakers can't or won't do for themselves. And despite what that ad suggests, the law that established this board specifically prohibits rationing. And the second ad, the throw granny off the cliff ad, <laughs> the, it was done by a group known as the Agenda Project. And you know it showed this Paul Ryan character throwing her off the cliff. Paul Ryan, of course, is the Republican chairman of the House Budget Committee 
who authored a plan that seeks to limit costs in Medicare by capping the rate of growth and then having seniors stop, shop around for the best deal in the private market. Never mind that the plan would not affect anyone currently at over the age of 55, and in fact has now been tweaked to allow anyone to keep traditional Medicare if they prefer. The ad, ad instead kind of demonizes the idea as privatizing Medicare. Now, I actually find both of these ads really depressing because they choke off the possibility of reasonable debate and discourse. Now, one could have legitimate concerns about either of these ideas or proposals, but they both actually try to achieve the same goal, reduce costs in Medicare, which over, threaten, over time threatens to overwhelm the federal budget. And I think groups like this do a disservice to our democracy by somehow suggesting that people who are trying to come up with ideas, trying to tackle what everyone agrees is a legitimate problem, by suggesting that those people are in some way evil. In any case, as this presidential campaign heats up, we can expect more of these misleading attacks and claims. Uh, I will continue to try to expose the truth. I hope you will too. I welcome suggestions of claims to check, ads to look at. I spend my time looking at these things. <laughs> it's a depressing duty, but someone has to do it. Anyway, thank you very much. And I don't, I don't know if we have time for questions. I'll take questions if I'm happy to. Yeah, sir. Some, some of the issues you've talked about are esoteric, where they really require wonk analysis to compare years and budgets. But some are just such ridiculous. You know, they, four Pinocchios might not be enough. You want to make four <laughs> Pinocchios with an oak leaf cluster or something? Is, is the assumption in putting those things forward the big lie that if they just repeat them often enough and people will fall for them? Do they think people don't know enough to even detect the gigantic whoppers? Well, you know, the sad truth is, is that negative advertising works. That's, I mean, that's the, that is the, you know, in fact, you know, Mitt Romney uh, was, um, uh, you know, the way he won the Republican primaries was he, he or his super PAC associates just sent a torrent of negative advertising against his, his main competitors. You know, as soon as a guy emerged, whether it was Rick Perry, negative ads, slamming him. Newt Gingrich, negative ads, slamming him. And that made, and those other guys were much less well-funded, couldn't compete. Now, you can argue whether or not, you know, they were, you know, good candidates or bad candidates or should have been the Republican nominee, but ultimately, Mitt Romney won on the basis of highly negative ads. And, you know, the, President Obama, when he was running against McCain, uh, he raised so much money that he was able, actually, to have a tremendous number of positive ads, but he spent more on negative ads than John McCain spent total, because McCain accepted the, you know, the fundraising limits and Obama didn't. So now with these super PAC ads, anyway, uh, the, the, the answer is yes, I think over time they think these things work. I mean, you can see, even no matter how ridiculous or bad some of these things are, it, um, convinces people. I mean, one of my favorite examples, I don't know if you remember a senator named Alphonse D'Amato, who uh, was widely regarded as having all sorts of shady connections, corruption issues, or what have you. His last big race, he was, uh, uh, the, on the Democratic side, they were, the Democrats were having to choose between Geraldine Ferraro or a man named Robert Abrams, who was then the uh, Attorney General of New York. And uh, Democrats decided, oh, Geraldine Ferraro, there are all those sleazy problems, you know, you know, we need a Mr. Clean, an absolute Mr. Clean to go against Mr. Corrupt. So Robert Abrams, who was considered clean as a whistle, narrowly defeated Ferraro for the primary. Now, Alphonse D'Amato somehow found some errant sentence in some obscure report that indicated there was something fishy with some fundraising by Abrams. And they ran a torrent of negative ads just making Alphonse D'Amato look sleazier than Alphonse D'Amato. And, and Abrams was like so stunned. I was like, I'm Mr. Clean. How could I possibly, how could you say? He didn't even know how, know how to respond. So the net result is that this was 1992, the year of Bill Clinton, overwhelming Democratic vote 
for the election for Bill Clinton. He won New York by 30 points. Alphonse Amato defeated Abrams by 20,000 votes. But 50,000 people walked into that voting booth and voted for the presidential election but chose not to cast a vote in the Senate election because they decided, you know, I can't vote for Alphonse, I can't vote for Abrams, they're all corrupt. Great example of how negative advertising works. Yes, sir. Have there been any studies that you're aware of that would show average citizens one of these videos and then ask them if they think it's true and so forth to, to probe the depth of their knowledge? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I know that you know, most of these ads are very carefully focus grouped before they ever run. I mean, they're, they, you know, they're, they're, the, the campaigns themselves will, will I mean, you know, the, the master of this was actually Bill Clinton, who they, his campaign, they set up little kiosks in, uh, in shopping malls and test words or whatever, and then whatever word or phrase got, you know, a higher score, it would end up in Bill Clinton's speeches, you know, because it was just, a, it was just, it just figured out what, how it resonated with people. But in terms of, you know, having people sit there and say, do you think this is correct or not? I don't know, you know, visual images are very powerful. And you can just see even like the, the two ads, you know, pro-Romney, anti-Romney on Obama. Are you saying Romney's, you know, the snippets, you know, Romney says these things? Well, that's in his words, you know, it seems very visually powerful. I had two questions. One was um, one of the earlier ad where you saw jobs in Finland, Mexico, China. Was it your point that there were also jobs created in the U.S., or was it factually incorrect that the, those were jobs overseas? Those were all factually incorrect. None of those things were true. They had little citations, most of which were from uh, like a newspaper like the Washington Times, but they didn't even quote the Washington Times right. You know, it wasn't really what the Washington Times said. I mean, it was just, ma I mean, and it, like I said, there, there, for example, it said, you, and the way it's written in a very uh, slimy manner. So, for instance, it said, you know, $2 billion went, or whatever it was, went to a company building a plant in Mexico. Oh, I see. So, yes, that company was indeed building a plant in Mexico, but the money they received went to build a plant in California. I mean, it, you know, these are global companies. It, um, my other uh, thought was uh, what you do, I think, is great because it's, you do it frequently and it's in one place and it's a very focused, you know, what are they telling the truth? Um, are you at least somewhat optimistic that, uh, you know, your prominence there in the Washington Post and other groups like yourself, like PolitiFact and so on, that there'll be a feedback mechanism so the politicians are like, wait a minute, we better be careful or people will think we're lying because, say, Glenn Kessler and so on will, you know, say, hey, call us out with four Pinocchios or whatever. Well, it's on the margins, maybe. I mean, I, I, I really, the, the people I serve are, are, I'm not, I can't change politicians' to behavior. I do hope to, you know, enlighten voters, make people more skeptical about the things they hear from politicians. I will notice that Romney will occasionally tweak some of his language and change it a little bit to address some of the things I've raised. Uh, the White House tends to ignore what I write. Uh, the campaigns will, if I give three Pinocchios to a Romney, the Obama campaign will send it out or cite it out. The, the opposite thing, you know, during the, uh, uh, the Republican debates, uh, you know, Newt Gingrich accused uh, Romney of getting four Pinocchios, which was true. <laughs> and, then, and then my favorite was, you know, there was this ad that, the, that a, super, a, a Newt Gingrich-related super PAC ran called the King of Bane, which was, I, I didn't, it didn't have the time to put it here, but it, it was truly awful. And I, I gave it four Pinocchios. And so Newt Gingrich went out and he held a press conference and said, well, the Washington Post fact checker gives it four Pinocchios. I demand that they take that ad down. <laughs> I said, all right. And the, the super PAC said, never mind. We have nothing to do with him, so we'll keep running it. <laughs> but at least he said that. Yes, ma'am. Do the broadcast networks bear any responsibility for airing these things without any fact checking done, or should they? Well, in theory, um, they're supposed to. It's, you know, it's, a lot of this is local TV. And I was at, recently at a symposium where they, some of the, they actually had some of these, these people who make these decisions. And basically, 
the answer was, well, they show us, for instance, you know, that's why, that's why a lot of these ads will have a little citation at the bottom. It'll say Washington Times. And they say, well, as long as we see things like that, it means that there's some, it's based on something. <laughs> and, and, you know, they don't, you know, we don't have the resources or whatever to go forward. And because, you know, the Washington Post or PolitiFact say it's factually incorrect, we can't really, that's just an opinion of someone else. We can't really, ba you know, base our decisions on that. And, and frankly, it's really good ad revenue. It's a tremendous amount of revenue. Yes. So the cynical truth is that whoever has the more money will produce the slickest ad to the audience they think will go for it, and that's what it's all about. You buy it. Yeah, well, that's, that's, why, that's why the newspapers write a lot about how much money people have raised, because money being raised goes into advertising. Advertising has tremendous impact on voting patterns. Does that mean if there were less money, there would be less of these negative ads, or would they spend all of that smaller amount on these negative ads? <laughs> <laughs> well, there would be, yeah, be fewer negative ads, but what you, what you will see because of the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United, which allows the, you know, the rise of these super PACs, the, the, this is just going to be, I mean, this com coming campaign, it will be the nastiest, most brutish campaign in our history with the most amount of money spent. And in the end, it will be extraordinarily close, uh, you know, not only because of the economic situation, but just because of the tremendous money being spent. And you, and you, and you, you know, we're lucky, you know, well, I guess Virginia is a battleground state, so you'll see, see these kind of ads because of Virginia. Maryland doesn't count. Um, but, um, you know, if you're in a battleground state, if you're in Ohio, which is uh, literally the entire election will come down on how Ohio votes because there's no way Romney can become elected president without winning Ohio. So, you know, uh, you, Obama will put everything he can in Ohio, as will Romney. And it's a microcosm of the United States. It's very close. The people of Ohio, it will be like scorched earth. They will, not, <laughs> they will not be able to turn on their TV, and they'll just see all these things over and over again. May I follow up and ask about other countries? Uh, do, do we see similar phenomena in other countries, or haven't you looked at that? Well, I, I know I've seen, I mean, they, they, they do have, a lot of the guys that, and women that make these ads do it overseas, too. I mean, when, they're not, when it's not our election cycle, they're over in other countries doing it. Uh, different countries have different rules. I believe uh, France, uh, there's no polling the last few days of an election. I think there may be no ads allowed the last week. You know, the rules like that, that, that could have an impact. But of course, you know, we now have, uh, you know, 30% of Americans will vote in the presidential election, not on election day, but through early voting. So that's another whole aspect of it. You know, you could, people could cast their ballots in early October because they know who they're going to vote for. And uh, so, you know, who knows what the impact would be. Yes, sir. Is your column syndicated? And if so, uh, how's the syndication do? You know, I don't, it, it, is, it is released as part of the Washington Post news service to other newspapers. I mean, there are a number of newspapers that pick it up. You know, and the, most of it, I, most of my columns appear online. It only appears on Sunday in the Washington Post. I pick like the most interesting or popular column of the week and put it in the Sunday paper. But you know, like all print news organizations, we're mostly going to the web. Yes, sir. Uh, have you ever had to change your Pinocchio account? Um, occasionally, you know. What do I always say? If new information comes out, uh, I mean, for instance, uh, and I have an assistant who also writes some of these columns. Uh, we did one. It had to do with um, Rom the Obama campaign, saying he had, he had boosted the debt during his time in office, which we originally said was worth three Pinocchios. And then we discovered, it wasn't widely known, that actually some of that debt was run out of operating expenses, came from operating expenses. And like I said, it, it started you know, with a, under previous governors. Romney just continued it. But it was enough that I felt we should go from two to three, just to dress it down a little bit. Because you know, there was some running up of the debt. It was not quite a cut and dried thing where, you know, it, it, but it still they made it pretend, they made, the Obama people made it seem like 
this was debt brought up like national debt and most state debt. The states, they don't, don't print money, so they, it's a totally different animal. Oh, um, there is such a fact checker um, element in the Washington Post back in 2008, and then you brought it back early last year, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I guess after this political year, it might go into hiatus. No, I'm, I'm not planning to. No, no, I, 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 I would hope to keep it as a permanent feature now, because I actually, um, there's so much stuff said in, on Capitol Hill and in Congress that, that <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, it's an endless, endless thing. And I, I've actually, it's, I've had some impact on Capitol Hill. I, there was a very senior member of the Democratic leadership who called me up and said, what do I do to stop getting Pinocchios? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. I have to, so, you, what, what's a recent one where they did great? Uh, G a recent Geppetto, boy, they're so rare. And, <laughs> is that uh, because you don't look at claims that are not well, dubious? Well, well, yes. I mean, part of it is a self-selecting thing. It can, and like, I, and I, I don't. I do try to find things that tell you a larger story and be a lar you know, a larger tell you a little bit about the federal budget, a little bit about how Medicare works, or that sort of thing, as opposed to just picking some random statement. That wasn't true of the uh, Rutherford v. Hayes thing. That seems to be really trivial. Well, except, you know, it's interesting. There were some readers that were objected to that one. I didn't think it was trivial because for, there, there, I, do make, I do make different standards. Um, for instance, I grade not as harshly if someone is just saying something in a TV interview. But if it's part of an actual speech, which meant that, that you know, there were, there was staff discussion, what are we going to do? How are we going to put this in, in here? How are we going to frame this? And in this case, the president was talking about one of his predecessors. He did it in a really nasty, dismissive way, saying he was looking backwards, you know, I'm looking forwards, he's not on Mount Rushmore, uh, that, that to me, I mean, I, this is a presidential speech. You have a whole staff at the White House who are supposed to vet ideas and claims. The, you know, why didn't that White House go and t check with the, with, the, with the actual records? Now, you can say it's, it's a trivial matter. I think it says something, about, I, I actually, you know, there was a, a lot of discussion among um, p political people in this town, Democrat and Republican, about there are serious problems with the way this White House checks their facts, and that they put they re they they cite they cite. I did one thing re recently where they they cited this poll that said millionaires support the Buffett rule. It was like an opt-in email poll. You know, the White House shouldn't be citing opt-in email polls. <laughs> You know, it, it's, it's just, you know, they'll grab it, or they, they recently grabbed this thing. Um, there was some totally bogus uh, opinion piece that came out that said that Obama had the lowest increase in spending of, over, after the, over the last 60 years, which a few checks on that, just not. The, the way the whole analysis was done was um, really weak. And frankly, the President of the United States does have the Office of Management and Budget that is supposed to do budget research. And if you want to make a particular claim about, you know, how your budget compares historically to other presidents, you would rely on the, the career experts of the Office of Management and Budget. You wouldn't rely on an opinion piece by some blogger, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of strange that, so I do, you know, I. There were readers that said I was really nasty. I shouldn't have given four Pinocchios for that. And in fact, Jay Carney, the White House spokesman, called me up before I ran that column and said I was devaluing the Pinocchio rating. By, <laughs> by rating it. I, it was so touching that he cared. <laughs> yes, sir. It sounds like you're equally popular and unpopular with both sides. It sounds like your objective has either side simply tried to discredit you and say that you're biased. Well, uh, I I don't they, they, they don't you know neither they, don't, they haven't been that blatant about it. I don't know who writes those anonymous comments on the on the on the website. 
Uh, depending on what I write, I'm either you know a right wing you know hack or a left wing whatever. You know, I, I you know, I mean, there have been studies that shown that people come, they, um, they digest information according to particular partisan lenses, and so they will be more receptive to information that validates things that they already think. And it's very hard to break through that. Now, you know, I, uh, you know, I have particular personal beliefs about various issues, but I really keep it completely separate from what I do at the fact checker, in part because I've had three decades of dealing with politicians and I've, I always joke, if I ever write an autobiography, I'll title it, Waiting for People to Lie to Me. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I, there's just, that's just the nature of the beast. And so I look at each statement. I don't really care who said it or, you know, or why they said it. I just look at the statement and try to understand the factual basis behind it. I've seen these ads recently. And it always ends with, tell President Obama, blah, 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 and it's new majority uh, something. What is that? I, and obviously, it's an anti-Obama ad, but they couch it by saying, tell Obama. But that, they have to do that. That's under the, under the, under the, oh. the rules in which they are. That's one of those super PAC ads. Yeah. And they can't, uh, they can't be pro before or against a particular candidate, but they can run an issue ad, an issue-oriented ad. So they always have to say at the end, you know, it's part of pretending that it's, it's part of an, it, they don't really want you to go tell or whatever, to, <laughs> but, but it's there for, you know, because if they just, you know, they can't say vote against Obama, but they can send you a message, Obama's a really bad guy, tell Obama or, or tell John Tester or whoever. Yeah, but that's, that's, the super, that's the super PAC thing. Listen. Have you ever been invited to speak in front of a Democratic or Republican group? And if so, how do they react? You know, I haven't been invited. I'm not sure that the Washington Post would let me speak in front of a partisan audience. You know, this, the, this group, you know, capital area skeptics doesn't sound partisan, so <laughs> I can do it. Yes, sir. So, so what can we do as consumers of, of this kind of information? What can we do to not get taken other than, of course, read your column? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess the, uh, you just have to have a very jaundiced out. I mean, I, I've, I've written in one of my columns, I said whenever. So it should be said it's not skeptical. Yeah, right. Well, you just, yeah, you just have to be, uh, you know, abs skeptics. I mean, it's, if it's in front of your face and they're, put, they're putting it together in a way, they're putting it in a way to manipulate your emotions and to, and it's, you just can't believe it. I mean, I've, I've written on occasion that if a Medicare ad comes on, just mute the TV. <laughs> Don't even bother to look at it, because if it's on about Medicare, either side is going to, you know, try to mislead you. And, and like I said, I mean, particularly those last two I showed, you know, it, that's the sad thing, is that both of those concepts are designed to deal with the same problem the rising cost of Medicare, which is a problem. It has to be dealt with in some way or the other. We can have a reasonable debate about what the best way to do it is. But you know, this country will never be able to solve its problems if either side is demonized in such a way, which is, you know, say what you will about Paul Ryan or say what you will about Barack Obama. You know, in theory, they both care about this country, and they both want to try to solve a problem. A large, large parts of the Obama, of the Ryan Medicare plan actually draws on concepts that are in Obamacare, the health care law. You know, they have similar ideas, but in one, you know, and in fact, you know, the sad truth about the individual mandate is that it was originally a Republican concept. And once it was embraced by a Democrat, it suddenly became, you know, horrible for Republicans to support.